gift in ministering to us. Uh, just before we hear the word of the Lord being preached, we have a special song uh, this morning. Many of you have been waiting for me to sing, uh, to, to rap. And so uh, today would not be the day. However, we do have uh, 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 Tochuku and his angels. Uh, uh, let's welcome Tochuku as he comes to minister this morning. Good morning, church. Yeah, we're here to sing uh, to the glory of God. Uh, just this morning, uh, we were able to attend the Bible study, and the Bible study aligns with our song this morning, just to show that the Holy Spirit works. You know, the Bible, talk, the Bible study was about um, the wonders of God, the creation of God, and our songs today is here to affirm uh, the wonders God did in creating man, you know. If you have seen, uh, been opportunity to see the anatomy of human diagram, you see that the, how the, the nerves, you know, God intertwined the nerves over uh, about seven trillions of nerves in, in human, you know. So that disputes, you know, all the theories of the herb theories, the Big Bang theories, those can be real because if you see how God created the nerves, you, you can agree that those are not just Big Bang's theory. Praise God. Well, lately you have been thinking, I know we have been busy, and I'm here to give you reasons. My life is all about Jesus the Lord. If I give you kind of feelings, just be patient and stay with me. Trillion nerves in my body, and if you see me, your body, you got some designated to your eyelids, another one to your eyelids. You see, they are intertwined in that body, the designer is Yeshua, daddy. I never seen anybody wiser than Yeshua. Nobody, nobody. Yeshua, ah, 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 Yeshua, ah, 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 Yeshua, ah, 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 Yeshua. No, we didn't come from the Big Bang. MF Revolutionary Trash, trillion nerves in my body. And it is same in your body, you got some designated to your eyelids, another one to your iris, it is it, the intertwined in that body, the designer is Yeshua, daddy, uh, I never see anybody wiser than Yeshua, uh, nobody, nobody. Yes, you are. 
that becomes a massive challenge. <clears throat> next, uh, next concert, we will be featuring that. And uh, the next time we have a special song, we're going to be having uh, Brother Benson Ogbede. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, also Doyin Talabi. Many of you don't know that Doyin Talabi used to sing. And so we will have them back and challenge the young people that we can still rap, you know. It's great to do something for God uh, at whatever level, just... Put yourself out there. Let God get the glory for your life. And so we appreciate that ministry today. If you have your Bibles there with you, uh, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 8 is where I want to read from. It's a bit of a lengthy scripture. But a first grader in a school, a young lad, was told to come home. Uh, from school directly, his parents told him, when you finish school, just make sure you come home. But every so often, he will arrive home late. Day by day, he would come in late, and then sometimes between uh, you know, 10 to 20 minutes, he will be late. So his mother asked him, you get out of school at the same time every day. Why can't you reach and get home every day at the same time? The young boy replied his mother and said, it depends on cars. The mother said, what does car have to do with it? Then the young lad explained and said, the patrolman who takes us to cross the street makes us wait until some cars come along so that he could stop the cars. How many of you know there are some people that you give power to? And they want to show you that they have power. I'm in authority here. Most religious organizations or most religious bodies will believe that God allows for human leadership. However, he wants leaders to reflect the divine values and divine principles that he has. Today, you would hear on the social media a lot of attacks against all forms of leadership. It doesn't mean just Christian leadership. You would hear this in governmental leadership. People are no longer concerned about attacking. In the text that we are going to read today, 1 Samuel chapter 8, I'm going to read out of the HCSB version. The Bible says these words, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges over Israel. His firstborn son name was Joel and the second one's Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, however, his sons did not walk in, the ways, in his ways. They turned towards dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and went to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not follow your example. Therefore, appoint a king to judge us as the same as the other nations have. When they said this, sir, uh, uh, then they said, uh, give us a king to judge us. Samuel considered their demand sinful. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to the people and everything they say to you. They have not rejected you. Uh, they have rejected me as their king. They are doing the, uh, the same thing uh, to you that they have done to me. Uh, since the day I brought them out of Egypt until this, they abandoning me and worshiping other gods. Listen to them, but you must solemnly warn them and tell them about the rights of the king who would rule over them. Verse 10. Samuel told all the, all the, Lord, all the Lord's word to the people who were asking him for a king. He said this to them. These are the rights of the king who would rule over you. He will take your sons and put them in the use of his chariots on horses, 
and running in front of his chariot, uh, he can appoint them uh, for the use of commanders uh, of thousands, of commanders of fifties to plow his ground or to reap his harvest uh, or to make weapons of war uh, or the equipment for his chariot. In verse 13, uh, he can take your daughters to become perfumers, cooks, and bakers. Uh, he can take your best field and vineyard and olive orchard uh, and give them to his servant. Uh, he can take a tenth of your grain and your vineyard uh, and give them to his officials and servant. Uh, he can take your male servant and your female servant, uh, your best young men and your donkeys uh, to use for his work. Um, he can take uh, a tenth of your flock uh, and uh, you yourself can become his servant. Uh, when that day comes, uh, you will cry out because of the king you have chosen for yourself. Uh, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. Uh, the people refused to listen um, to Samuel. No, they said, uh, we must have a king over us. Uh, then we would be like all the nations. Uh, our king will judge us, uh, go out uh, before us and fight our battles. Uh, Samuel listened to all the people's words uh, and he repeated them to the Lord. Uh, listen to them uh, the Lord said to so we want to, I want to minister this morning a sermon I've entitled Divine Design. And uh, listening to just that scripture there, you can begin to wonder. The first thing I'd like to consider with you is what I call <clears throat> the flawed human being views. With so much books and seminars available to us on leadership. You could go into a library, you could go into a bookstore, there are so many books on leadership. It remains a wonder why many people still don't fully understand the role and the responsibility of leadership. We fail to grasp for the reason why there is a leader. There are many misconceptions or, or even outdated beliefs about how to lead. People want to enter into that office. They don't understand what the office is about. Uh, uh, what do we do with leadership? Uh, uh, they fail to understand that leadership is a granted power and an authority given to someone. We read in our text, Samuel's sons were made judges. They were appointed by their father to become the next uh, uh, rulers of the people of Israel uh, to lead them, to guide them. Uh, and, uh, but on the other hand, we understand the character of these two men. Um, they perverted justice. Uh, they received bribes. Uh, they were very dishonest and they always gathered to themselves dishonest gains. And because the people were seeing the traits of these men that were meant to futuristically lead them, they approached Samuel uh, and began to compare themselves with the nations of the world. Uh, they begin to talk about other nations. Uh, we want to be like them. Uh, we are demanding for our own king. Uh, we want to be ruled by one man that would go before us into battle. Uh, that's the kind of person that we want. Here are some summer, common examples of flawed leadership. There are people that simply believe that leadership is just about the title. I'm not talking about church leadership alone here now. But in leadership, there are people that just say, I want to be at the head because it, it feels good to be at the head. Leadership by backing others. There are people that believe that when you are a leader, the, the traits and the character you have to do is to yell instructions and, and orders at are, 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 are people. Others believe that leadership is just for their personal gain. We see these traits uh, amongst the government, our politicians. Uh, I'm a leader of the people. I'm disconnected from the people. I need to enrich myself. Leadership. Is to be followed, or uh, others believe that leadership is to serve, to be served by the followers. People believe that if you are a leader, everyone around you must serve you there at your back and at your call. Uh, there are others that also assume that lead, being leadership means that you are infallible. 
that you have no flaws. You have no, you are an infallible person. You can never do wrong. You are above reproach and you are above accountability. If you are a leader, there's a sense that nobody can challenge me. Nobody, I'm, I'm not accountable to anybody. And, it, and, and as a matter of fact, I'm disconnected from everyone else. That's what makes me a leader. I'm unapproachable. These types of leadership are commonly found around us. There are husbands that are completely disconnected from the reality of the family they are meant to lead. There are employers that believe that by backing out others is what makes them leaders. We see this sometimes even in the kingdom of God. There are congregations that cannot approach their leader. They cannot cry to their leader. They have no living relationship with him or her. They have no connection whatsoever. Whatever he says must be true. Whatever he tells us to buy must be genuine. We don't even think about it. We don't even question it. And this is the mindset that people have. The best form of man's understanding of leadership is flawed. Has errors in it. Most politicians believe that the position of leadership gives them power. This is why everybody wants power. In, a, in Africa here, it's even worse. It's so bad that if you put a uniform, you know why Nigerians love uniform? Because it gives them more power. You see somebody, um, uh, he's a local government uh, worker, and uh, he has no statutory right or power. He has no constitutional right to enter your vehicle. Or, but I'm wearing uniform. So I've got some authority and I've got some power. You see people that everybody wants to be the head and nobody wants to be the tail. You hear people, I'm a head of department. And that's what they portray to you. I'm a man in authority. I've got some power. I, I, I'm a leader of some sort. I'm, I'm the head of the cleaning department. I'm the head of the car park department. Everybody wants to be a head of a department. Again, we see, again in Africa, overaged presidents that are still holding on to power after 45 years of ruling the people. You know, after 40 years of ruling the people and the people are still impoverished, don't you think that something is wrong with your leadership? After, uh, yeah, <clears throat> thank God that in Nigeria is eight years. We can't endure more than eight years. Because after eight years, if we are still back to where we were, or worse, or from where we started from, then something is wrong with leadership. You'll see people, they're completely disconnected from reality. I was looking at the president, uh, uh, Tore, uh, Theodoro Obiang of Equatorial Guinea. He had been the president of that nation for 44 years. He can hardly walk. They carry him. He has to go to France. He actually lives in France and he only comes on Independent Day to Equatorial Guinea once a year. But he's a leader. We see this also with Paul Bia of Cameroon. 41 years of leadership. He had done multiple plastic surgery. It's not the way you look. It's the content of your heart. You've got nothing to offer these people. Museveni in Uganda, 37 years of leadership. Paul Kagime of Rwanda, 23 years. He looks young. That's because all the body parts have been replaced. But they are in leadership now. They are not moving. Don't you ever think that someone else can do this a little bit better than you are doing? These people view themselves as the only solution to their people's problems and nothing can, they can do can go wrong. That is a flawed sense of leadership. Saul, in our text this morning, he finds himself in a position of authority. He wasn't born a king. He wasn't born a leader, 
but he finds himself in that position of leadership. And we know that Saul looked the part. He looked head above others. He's lanky. He's good looking. And sometimes we choose leadership based on the external outlook. Or maybe their oratory skills, how they speak, what they say. And we'll say to ourselves, that's my leader there. But there's a disconnect between the leader and the follower. He looked the part externally. But Saul lacked the inward character of a leader. One man said these words, and that one man being Pastor Glenn, he said, when nobody becomes a somebody, then somebody will become intoxicated and contaminated. When you were a nobody at one time, and then you find yourself to become somebody, the problem is that new position can become intoxicating. It can become contaminated as believers seated in this building this morning. Rather than being called a leader ourselves, we ought to be seeking for people that are submitted to what God's will is, what God wants, and chosen by God to lead us. Rather than us looking around and saying we want to choose our own leaders, we are going to have this week, who's going to be our next pastor? Let's look around. Who's good looking? A lot of people would qualify. We need to understand that it has to be God's choice. I believe that God has a different approach to leadership. Someone that he puts together, he sees beyond. Man sees differently. Saul after Samuel, after Saul had failed, Saul and Samuel goes down to Jesse's household, and all he's looking out for is someone that's similar to the outlook of Saul, someone that has the external appearance of authority. I realize that if you have an external appearance of authority and respect, but you lack the character, you cannot be a godly leader. Good preaching. So let's look secondly this morning at finding divine, God's divine design. God's appointed leaders are those that do not seek to rule for themselves, but for the benefit and the good of others. He looks at Peter and says, Peter, loveth thou me? Do you love me? And he says, you're going to be a leader upon this rock. You shall build, I shall build my church. You are going to be a leader, but but it's not for your benefit, but for the benefit of others. According to God, it is best not to lead if you are not willing to be led. You cannot just evolve and say, I am a leader. What we see in the Christendom today are people that have never been led right, but they are now claiming leadership. Pastors that don't have a pastor that they are accountable to. They just start up their own ministry and all of a sudden uh, they become the, the alpha and the omega of the ministry. Uh, they actually sometimes change the name of the church to their own personal title and name. They are not responsible to no one. They are not accountable to no one. God's nature is to create. Say amen. To give. <clears throat> To serve, to exemplify. So if that is God's nature, he also expects his leaders to be similar. That we exemplify, we serve the people. We give to our people ourselves. Or we are compassionate to be wise, to be accountable. That we empower others uh, and then we partner with his design. God's leadership learns to do things God's way and relies on God's direction or redirection. If you are a man or a husband here or you own a business and you are a believer, you better understand that if God has placed you in that position of influence and leadership, he can also redirect you. 
God can change uh, the direction of your heart. Uh, and as a good leader, you respond to the dealings and the directions of God. But there are people that would adamantly stand down and say, I don't care. I'm the leader here. Let me say this. If you are a husband and you have to once in a while constantly remind your congregation, which is your family, that you are the head, perhaps you are really not the head. If you have to be telling your wife, I am your, I am your husband, you know, I am your head. Maybe it's as a result of bad leadership. Your position is under threat. There are others that claim to be leaders, but no one is following them. One man said, if you're a leader and you're, no one is following you, you are not a leader, you're simply taking a stroll. Matthew chapter 8, in verse 8 to 10, it says, Lord replied, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. But say the word and my servant will be scared, cured. So, for I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, I'll do this, and he does it. Uh, hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said uh, to all those following him, I surely, I say to you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. The centurion understands the hierarchy of leadership. He understands that he's a man that has influence and authority and power. But he also understands that he is under authority and power. He's not uh, taking full, he says, absolute power. I'm the, I'm the one in charge. There's no one to be accountable to. And this is the structure. This is the divine design uh, that I'm talking about. Jesus marveled. At the disposition of this leader, and then he commended him. Moses, though, was being a leader. And I'm talking here, not just in a gender of male. This can also go for women that have their businesses and they're doing things in a position of leadership. But listen to me. Moses, though, was a leader, was still willing to submit to the advice and learn from his father-in-law. Moses is a, <coughs> he's, he's a deliverer. Three million people are coming out of Egypt. They are finding themselves uh, approaching the promised land of God. They've got issues. Uh, and Moses will stay up all day trying to solve their problem. Uh, uh, but Moses uh, is doing this thinking there is no other leader here. I'm the one. Uh, and he's overwhelmed. Jethro comes and pays him a visit. Uh, and he rebukes Moses. He said, Moses, you're going to just die. You're going to die because you are trying to do everything by yourself. Look for men that you can give authority to. Men that understand that they are under your authority but that can minister to other groups. And so he took this advice from Jethro and Moses' health was prolonged. For years, we read about Samuel demonstrating what it is to be a godly leader. We know that his children took a detour. They didn't follow in his steps. But Moses, uh, um, uh, Samuel kept his eyes on the cross. One of the things that I realize is this, and I pray it doesn't happen, but it does happen. Because you are a godly man, are no guarantees that your children are going to follow godly. There are no guarantees. You could be a pastor. It doesn't mean your children are going to live for God. And they may live for God because you force them to come to church, but in their mind, they're already rebelling against you. In their mind, they can't wait to get married and that's it. You'll never see them again. In their mind, they can't wait to <clears throat> move out of your authority. But, and uh, it's sad, but that's true. There's no guarantee that because you are in church, your children will live for God. Samuel, the greatest, one of the greatest of all leaders, his children were not living for God. They were defrauding people in church. They were in leadership for material gain. But Samuel maintained his work with God. He maintained his testimony. He didn't amass wealth to himself. People think that being in leadership because you see all this money around you, that you have a right to the use of everything. Say amen. That's what people think. 
People think that now I'm the governor. You know, I could, uh, I could do whatever I want to do with all this. This is my money. It's not yours. Samuel would have come into a position such as that. People would have donated things to him in our generation. You know, not every donation of a, of a private jet. You've got one. You don't need three. Good preaching. Oh, you know what? Well, why don't you sell it? Let's, let's see what that can do in the kingdom. But Samuel was very transparent. He led with integrity of heart. He kept his position and his testimony of uprightness. So here is a question. As a leader, male or female, do you lead with integrity? Do you keep a testimony of uprightness? Are you demonstrating that you are a godly man or a godly woman? Because Samuel did, even though his sons were not. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 to 4, HSBC, what, it, listen to what it says. It says, then Samuel said to all of Israel, listen carefully. Now the, the new king is coming in. They've pushed Samuel out. Samuel is no longer going to be the judge. They want a king. <clears throat> Days before the coronation, Samuel is standing before the whole assembly. And he says, this is where the Bible comes in and says, then Samuel said to all of Israel, I have carefully listened to everything that you said to me and placed a king over you. Now you can see that the king is leading you. As for me, I am old and gray and my sons are here with you. I have led you from my youth until today. Here I am. Bring charges against, uh, against me before the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox or donkey have I taken? Whom have I wronged or mistreated? From whose hand have I taken a bribe or overlooked something? Then I will return it. You haven't wronged us. You haven't mistreated us. You haven't taken anything away from us. They all responded. I begin to wonder. After the eight years of Muhammad Buhari, and every subsequent president, of the past president, and including this current one, one of the greatest transitional statements that they could should make is anyone here in Nigeria that I have wronged? Is there anyone in Lagos State that I have taken something wrongly? I'm, I'm transparent. I, if you, if there's anybody. Speak up now and I will refund you. Integrity speaks. Can a husband stand before his household and say, is there any one of you, my family members that I have cheated? Can an employer stand, you employers, can you stand before your employees and say, is there anyone that I have not paid their salary? Has there been any bribe that I received back door? Is there anyone that has done that? You know, if there's anyone, come and stop right now. I wonder today, and we say we are leaders. How many leaders can submit themselves to be replaced? Certainly, the African presidents don't want to be replaced. How many of our leaders can be probed? Certainly, as soon as their time is over, they disappear. How many church leaders? How many family leaders? How many job leaders can stand and say, I have been guided by God? It's worth thinking about, guys. Because godly leaders submit their will to the will of him who has engaged them. You are not perfect. David wasn't. Saul wasn't. But you have been chosen to lead. How many Bible study leaders, how many team leaders, how many ministry heads can say that I have served the people with all of my might, strength, and soul. John 6, 38 says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, 
but the will of him who sent me. You have been sent by God to occupy that position of leadership. This is why the centurion gained God's attention. Knowing that you have not used your leadership, the privilege for yourself. Divine design of God sometimes makes you feel inadequate to lead. If you are a leader, you must have that unsettled, unsettling heart that I can't do this. This is beyond me. Not I am the one that the world is waiting for. There must be that unsettling inside of you. And you could say that even Saul, when Saul was eventually made the king on the day of his coronation, the Bible said he felt inadequate. He went to hide. I can't do this. Gideon said, I can't do this. I'm the least in my father's house. Why? I can't do this. When I was called into ministry, I remember fighting for a year. I can't do this. God, why me? I fought. My wife fought. We both fought. I can't do this. Because there must be that sense of personal inadequacy. Gideon didn't see himself as a mighty man of valor, but God saw him as one. Thou mighty man of valor. Gideon said, what, what might do I have? I'm the least in my father's house. What, what, are, you, what are you saying? Moses Moses, when he was called to go to uh, uh, Pharaoh, he said, I can't do this. I, I, I stutter at my words. My words are slow. By the time I finish a sentence, my head is off. Joshua, a great leader, had to be encouraged constantly by God. Uh, be of good courage. Only be strong uh, and you will do this. Only be strong. God constantly had to back him up with words because of sense of Inadequacy in leadership, unlike the world that we live, godly leaders would always be the first to acknowledge their weaknesses and their errors. See, there is nothing wrong with you coming up and say, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have sold water or soup. I made a mistake. I, I, I got carried away. Where I looked at the finances. It was not as much as I wanted it to be. So I tried to pervert it. A good leadership. And this is something that every one of us must want. Not only does God want us to be godly. Godly leaders receive a reward for doing well. Say amen. There are untold amounts of blessings that comes by following a godly leader. The blessings that come upon our lives, the blessings that come upon the godly leader, you can't equate it, you can't quantify it. By choosing godly leadership over popular opinion, we position ourselves to be exposed to more of God's wisdom, God's guidance that only God provides. If a man above you, whether it's your employer, okay, or a husband in the home, or some sort of women leader, or, you know, market leader, whatever leadership that you, uh, if you, if the person is godly, then they will lead by wisdom. You will hear things from their lips that are filled with wisdom and guidance that only God provides. I often worry. When people listen to someone, it could be in church, it could be in the community, it could be in the estate where you live, you listen to somebody because on the outward, their house looks nice, they drive good cars, but you go listen to them for wisdom and advice only for you to realize that they lack the credibility of leadership. They lack integrity. They lack wisdom. They lack guidance. And having gained wisdom from them, from godly leadership, it guides us and leaves us with a lasting legacy that has the power to influence our community. It can influence our family. It can influence our generation to come. If you follow a godly leader, don't be attracted because of eloquence. 
Don't be attracted of expository skills of the word of God. Don't be attracted because of numbers. Be attracted because of character. A character of integrity. And that's why you see people would say things, Oh, I trusted this man. I thought he was a fine brother. Beloved, you were attracted by charisma, not character. Proverbs 13 verse 22, a part says, A good man or a godly man leaves an inheritance for his grandchildren. In other words, when you follow somebody that is godly, they're not necessarily perfect, but they are godly. They fear the Lord. Then, you know that such a person would have something to say to the third generation. They will not be too puffed up to play with their grandchildren. I do have grandchildren in church here. And I do, just once in a while, I just pull them aside and I talk to them and play with them. Uh, and uh, I love to do that because I don't want to be disconnected from them. The children of Israel followed Joshua into the land. You know why? Because they saw godliness and courage in him. One man said these words. He says, courage involves facing challenges with confidence and conviction and trusting God's guidance. A godly leader with courage is always willing to risk it for the greater good of others to be courageous. So there is a transference of godliness. There's something about, and not most of us didn't get this from our parents. Most of our parents were not godly. But you can be. Becoming a godly leader is a matter of choice. You were not born godly. We were born as sinners. But we make a decision. And I look across this church, and every time I preach, I look across this church, and I see godly men and women here. Again, I, they're not perfect. They're not infallible. But I see men and women with great potentials of godliness. That God is waiting to touch their lives and raise them up. Godly leaders are not born. It comes with a con conscious decision to partner with God and to embrace his equipping. A godly leader would always provide a platform for others around him to grow and do better. That's why you see, you know, uh, some of the, you know, they're raising up other men, just giving them up opportunities. Some other men that is being raised up don't want it, but at least you don't stop it. You keep working with people. They may not have all the answers to all the questions, but God will back up a godly leader. Let me give you some examples here as I begin to round up my message. David, a man had blood in his hands. We know that is true. Is that right? David was told, you are not going to build my temple for me. You've got too much blood stain in your hands. And you will have thought that God will have disqualified David. But you know, God backed David up. And he backed him up to the point that he calls him a man after my heart. Not just that, he backed David up so much that when Jesus was being referred to, he was referred to as the son of David. My son, my, 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 my only begotten son is now being referred to a son of a man with blood in his hands. The indication of all of that is that David had the backing of God. David made provision for Solomon to excel in power and in wisdom. <clears throat> a good man leaves something for his children's children. <coughs> Regardless of the challenges that is before us this, month, this morning, we are better off embracing godliness and being a godly leader. I believe that if we take more time to know God, then we can begin to trust God that whoever he chooses may not be perfect because I know what happens to us. If God is raising up somebody, say there's a need in the church, we need somebody to be the uh, youth coordinator, and God chooses somebody, 
<clears throat> you know, we begin to, what we do is that we look for all their, all their problems, all their faults. That's what we bring out. See the person that pastor is, uh, is nominating. Is he not the same person? Like that? We start listening that why the person does not qualify and should not be used. God sees all those things that you see and sees more than you see. But he's looking for somebody after his heart. A godly leadership is not about enriching yourself, but it's about empowering others. Most times, if you see a man pass on to eternity, and he has no one that he can, can take off from where he is, or there's always going to be fights and squabbles and all kinds of nonsense going on, you find out that such a man was not a good or a godly leader. First Peter chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, as a fellow elder and witness of the suffering of the Messiah, and also a participant in the glory about to be revealed, I exhort you elders amongst you, shepherd the flock amongst you, not as overseers, <clears throat> not overseeing out of compulsion, but freely, according to God's will, not for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. God is saying, if you're going to be in leadership, if you're going to get married one day, <coughs> excuse me, if you're going to be a husband, if you're going to lead a business, you're going to, then it says, you've got to shepherd the people underneath you. You've got to care for them. <coughs> now, your motive is not money. Your motive is not you are the only one walking on red carpet. <coughs> I see so many leaders today. And what happens when they are no longer occupying that position? They are mere men. <coughs> the greatest leader of all emptied himself so that you and I can become full. Say amen. The greatest leader of all. Why? Because a godly leader is always secure in his position. He's not threatened by other rising leaders. I'll close with this story. <coughs> Sorry. Rather than close, I'll, I'll share this story, then I'll close in a few moments. Okay. 63-year-old Captain Coward. They call him Captain Coward because he was known for what I'm going to read to you. He became a coward, but he was a captain. 63-year-old Captain Coward, whose real name is Francesco Shitting new was the captain of the ship Costa Con uh, Concordia. How many of you remember Costa Concordia? Costa Concordia, he was the captain of the ship between 2006 and 2012. That was one of the greatest cruise ships that, that ran aground. <clears throat> Currently, this man is serving 16 years in prison uh, for being responsible for the grounding of the ship and the death of 32 passengers and crew. His criminal charge, why he was sentenced to 16 years imprisonment, was that he abandoned his ship when it was sinking. Costa Concordia was coming too close to the coast. And the reason why he was coming too close to the coast, he was bragging to his girlfriend. He had a wife, but he had a mistress on board. How well he can move close to the coast and move the ship outside so that it would not... What kind of madness, what kind of a leader is that? But he's doing that, and then Costa Concordia ran into sandbag, and it sank. Millions of dollars was lost. <clears throat> 32 people died. And uh, the first thing that this captain did when the ship was sinking was to jump off and go into a raft. You know? How many of you know, as a captain, you should be the last to leave? Oh, come on, somebody. As a captain, everybody must come off and you make sure everybody's that. Then you come off. But not so with this guy. <clears throat> I think about this man. How many captains do we have that are the first one to leave church? How many leaders do we have that rather than stay and re become strong like Joshua, they are the first to abandon ship? A godly leader that is worth following does not abdicate his responsibility when it's needed the most. And I declare to you that your family needs you. You must have something to say to your family, to your children. 
You must have something. The business is going bad. You must have something to say to your employees. Your ministry, you must have something to say to your members. Godly leaders don't give up on people. <coughs> Paul was a godly leader. John Mark had made mistakes, but he didn't give up on him. <coughs> the prodigal father was a godly leader. <coughs> His father never gave up on him. Even Samuel never gave up on Saul. The Bible tells us that after Saul died, Samuel was mourning for him. Don't give up on people and you will be a godly leader. There are people here, everything of your body says, you know what, they're not worth anything. But in godly leaders never gives up on God's design. I close with these two stories. Number one, the greatest leader in history. We know that his name is Jesus. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet the kings of the world feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He did not live in a castle, yet they called him Lord. He ruled no nations, yet they called him King. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. That's a godly leader. Now let me give you an incomparable leader. <coughs> More than 1900 years ago, there was a man that was born contrary to the laws of life, a virgin birth. This man lived in poverty and was reared in obscurity. He did not travel extensively, only once did he cross the boundaries of his country, which he had never lived, and that was during the exile in his childhood. He possessed neither wealth nor influence. His relatives were inconspicuous and neither trained, or, he neither trained in a formal education. His inf in, in infancy, he startled the king. In childhood, he puzzled doctors. In manhood, he ruled the cause of nature. He walked upon the waves and as pavement. He hushed the sea to sleep. He healed the multitude without medicine and made no charge for his service. He never wrote a book, and yet perhaps all the libraries of the world could not hold the book that have all been written about him. He never wrote a song, <clears throat> and yet uh, he furnished the theme of more songs uh, than more song writers combined. He never founded a college, but all the schools put together cannot boast of having so many students. He never marshaled an army, nor drafted a soldier, nor fired a gun, yet no leader ever had more volunteers who have, under his orders, made more rebel stacks, arms, and surrender without a fire in a shot. He never practiced psychiatry, yet he had healed many broken hearts uh, and all the doctors, than all the doctors combined. Uh, once a week, multitude congregates to worship and assembly to pay homage and respect to him. The name of the past proud, uh, uh, past proud statement of Greece and Rome have all been forgotten. The names of the past scientists and philosophers and theologians have come and gone. Man multiplies more and more. Though time has spared, uh, spread 1900 years between his people and this generation of, that, and the generation that mocked him at his crucifixion, he still lives. His enemies could not destroy him and the grave could not hold him down. He stands forth and highest pinnacle of heavenly glory, proclaiming, proclaimed God, acknowledged by angels, uh, adored by saints, feared by devils, re as a risen personal savior, this is our Lord and our savior, <clears throat> the uncomparable leader. If you're looking to learn what leadership is, it's not about reading from a book. The book refers to this book. You want to be a godly leader? Follow the word, the word of God. Say amen. And it doesn't matter what capacity that you are wanting to lead. 
You may be a single parent, male or female. You may be a husband. You may be a business owner. You may be an entrepreneur. You may be a teacher. You may be a, a worker in the house of God. You could be even the pastor of a church. The guide and the divine design is what you ought to follow. Can everybody say amen? amen. And I want to declare to you that God is going to raise up godly leaders in this place. Amen. Perhaps one of you and all of you or most of you will become one of them. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Almost specifically talking about leadership. But it's also talking about how to conduct your life as an example. It's talking about what is expected of you. As a child of God. You are not yet a leader, but there are things that is happening in you. God is raising you up. God is maturing you. God is preparing you. God is working on you. And you're not just being worked on because you want to be a leader. You're being worked on because you want to be godly. I want to be godly. I want to reflect the image of God. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good wife, a good mother, a godly wife, a godly mother. A godly husband. That's what I want to be. And it starts by allowing the word of God to guide you. This is God's design. This is what God wants. <clears throat> But before we can even claim godliness, we must first belong to God. We must repent of our sins. The Bible says all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. That there is none righteous, no, not one. Yet God demonstrates his love towards us. And that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. He didn't die on the cross so that we can come and pay him money. He died whether you believed it or not. And whether you accept it or not, he died for you in your place, in my place because he loves you and I and as we pause for a moment we want to pray together maybe you are here search your heart be true to yourself be honest you know in your heart that you are not saved you know in your heart that you're not right with God. You're not born again. You've never repented of your sins. You've never cried out for forgiveness. And this morning you can do that. And Jesus will come in and help you. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Maybe you're here. You're not saved. You're not right with God. You're not born again. You're not. You don't have an assurance of heaven being your home. But you want to have that assurance I'll tell you that God loves you would you come come true with God come on be honest would you raise up your hand so that I could see and pray for you 
Here's my hand raised up, Pastor Glenn. I'm not saved. I'm not born again. <clears throat> Come on, lift up that hand. Let's pray for you. Maybe you're a backslider. And your heart bears your witness that you're no longer faithful. You've compromised. Maybe somebody led you astray. Maybe you listen to some wisdom that is not godly. You allow your flesh room to rule. And as you're seated in this place, you're a backslider. Would you come back to Jesus? Here is my hand, Pastor. Please pray for me. Backslider, come on. It's better to be sa safe and sure. Amen. Christians, let me speak to you for a moment. The reality is, I chose to use the word leadership because whether we realize it or not, we are all occupying leadership positions. Now, <clears throat> I'm not talking here about the hand-picked call of God, but I'm talking about you have a position of influence. You are influencing your environment. You are influencing your family, your little space you are influencing. How well are you leading? Those that know you to be a Christian, do they see godly leadership in you? Or you're a leader that have lost integrity? Or you're a leader that have lost transparency? <clears throat> you say things that you don't mean. You mean things that you don't say. You are all over the place. You make your family very unsure and insecure. You make your employer, employees unsure and insecure. You make those that listen to you unsure and insecure. This morning, you can, you can, that can be transformed. Your minds can be renewed. God can change that. You can become a new person. God wants to raise you up to become influential in this generation. We're going to open these altars. I want to be a godly man. I want to be a godly woman. God, make me a man and woman of integrity and transparency, uprightness. I'm not going to violate my position. I'm not going to lead people astray. I'm not doing it for dishonest gain. But I'm going to do this eagerly. I have an example that's set before me. I'm not doing it for money. I'm not lording it over others entrusted to me. And I know that if I become a godly example, when the chief shepherd appears, when the, when the real leader appears, I would receive an unfading crown of glory for leading right. These altars are open. Let's find a place to pray. Can we all stand together? If you have to come up the stage, make your way on stage, especially those of you that come in first. Come, come. Find a place on the stage. Come and kneel down by the side. Let everybody, <clears throat> let us, let's all stand together and find a place to pray. If you're unable to come because of age, that you could stay where you are, but the rest of us, let's come and make a vow before God.